Google. It's there when you need to know something, whether it's a cocktail recipe, you want to know how tall an actor is, or you really just want to prove something wrong. Google has it covered. But while Google may be the king of search, it is still not the best at search. That title goes to the Muppet, Grover. Well, at least it's called Grover's algorithm. Searching may seem simple, but there's a lot going under the hood to make it great. If you want to search for something, you need a list to search through. And lists come in two different categories. They are either ordered or they are not. This is a book of Plato's work. If you wanted to find and read his cave allegory, then you could use the table of contents to find the page number 348, and then flick through the book quickly using the ordered page numbers to find the start of the allegory. Or you could have a conveniently placed bookmark, making it even easier. It's super convenient to have an ordered list, but an unordered list is a different beast. It is as if I pulled out all of the pages and randomly glued them back in. What a nightmare it would be to read a book in this state. If this were the only option, my guess is you would never read Plato's Republic. You can visualize an unordered search as a grid. Each element of the grid has the potential to be the page that you're looking for, but only one of them is correct. The question is, how do you find the page you want? You could go through sequentially and look for the right element, or you could randomly select elements to check. In either case, you would have to look on average 50% of the elements to find the correct one. This is called a linear search and it's just not efficient. You might be lucky and I got lazy when I was gluing the pages back in. I placed segments of pages together. This would be a partially sorted list. When you found a page with a number near what you were looking for, you could search around it and see if that segment contained the page you want. This would be much faster to search than a purely random placement but you can't always rely on having lists like this. At some point, you'll have to search through something that is truly unsorted. The internet is estimated to have over 2 billion sites with over 100 zettabytes of data. If you're not familiar with a zettabyte, you're not alone. It's a very big number. A zettabyte is 1024 exabytes, which is 1024 petabytes, which is 1024 terabytes. A 4K movie might take up 100 gigabytes, so one zettabyte can hold 10 billion movies. To put it another way, if we imagine a gigabyte as the size of a marble, then a zettabyte is the size of the sun. If every time you wanted to find a recipe for, say, a breakfast burrito, you had to sift through all of these websites, you would get sick of waiting and cook something else long before you had a recipe. If searching the internet is so hard, how is Google so good at it? If I Google breakfast burritos, I get 57 million results in 0.41 seconds. Clearly, they are not linearly searching through the entirety of the internet for this. Google is the king of search for a reason. So how do they do it? They use a few tricks, but they mostly achieve one goal. Quickly and accurately reduce the internet down to a small section of relevant pages. They take the unordered chaos of the internet and bring order through categorization. When you search for something with Google, you're not really searching the internet. Instead, you are searching through Google's indexation of the internet. There is no central registry for the internet. So Google has to make this index from scratch. To find new websites, Google is constantly checking for new pages through finding new page links on existing pages that they already know about or other means. Once they know a website exists, they'll send a bot out to crawl the website. Basically, the bot goes to the website and notes down what's on it. This allows Google to index the website with information about what is on there so that you can search for it. But what happens when you search Google's index? Luckily for us, they tell us a lot of how this works. When you search for something, Google's software identifies all of the potentially relevant pages and then ranks them based off hundreds of factors like keywords, links within the page, location, and the freshness. This is all while scanning these pages to remove any spam and nefarious ones. It is this ranking that is the real power behind Google. They do an excellent job at identifying and ranking what is relevant. But the thing is, Google is not searching through unordered lists. 
If you want to do this, you need something special to do it well. You need something quantum. You need Grover's algorithm. In the 1990s, quantum computing was emerging as a field of interest. Some of the most influential quantum computing papers were all published within a few years of each other. DiVincenzo published his guidelines on how to make a quantum computer, and Shaw published his famous algorithm that could factor numbers significantly faster than classical computers, which is often used to explain why quantum computers will be a significant issue for cryptography. Another big contribution was made by Grover when he published his algorithm on search. You don't need a deep understanding of quantum mechanics to understand how Grover's algorithm works. All you need to know is that we can represent our output from a quantum computer as a bunch of amplitudes of different states. And that Grover's algorithm is all about making one of these states have the highest amplitude so that we can find it. To begin with, the quantum computer has even amplitudes across all of the states. Then the quantum computer uses a search operator that flips the state that we're looking for to have a negative amplitude. Unfortunately, in quantum mechanics, we can only measure the absolute amplitude, so we can't tell the difference between a positive and a negative one. So instead, we flip the states around the mean amplitude. It's not really important how we flip around the mean amplitude, more that we can. This reduces the amplitude of the incorrect answer while increasing the amplitude of the correct one. This process can be performed multiple times until the amplitude is high enough to be measured so that you can find the desired state. But how much better is this than standard search? Well, we measure the effectiveness of algorithms, be it quantum ones or classical ones, through how the algorithm scales with size. That is, for a list of size n, how many operations need to be performed to get the answer. For a standard linear search, this is n divided by two. It requires half of the list to be searched on average, which is referred to as n scaling and is written as a function O, which represents order and the argument n. Now, remember this is slow. Anything that scales directly as a factor of n is bad. In contrast, Grover's algorithm has a square root of n scaling, which for larger lists is in a significant improvement. It is scaling like this where quantum computers have real value. The problem needs to be hard to solve, large in size, and we need to have an effective quantum algorithm to get any value out of quantum computers. Generally, unless if you're thinking of using a supercomputer to solve something, you probably won't get any value out of a quantum computer. But is Grover's algorithm actually useful? Running a quantum computer is expensive, it's difficult to program, and has significant overhead. Combine this with the fact that current quantum computers are subpar and require years or even decades of more research to make one that's useful. So no, Grover's algorithm isn't useful yet. Maybe when quantum computers are much better, we will find a use for it. Until then, the looming presence of Grover's superior technique will remain nothing more than a shadow. The quantum world is a fascinating one and might be responsible for time itself. But to understand this, you need to watch this video where I explain what we know and what we don't know about time. And if you wanna know more about Grover's algorithm, there are some useful references in the description.